coming up next, we have someone for whom this is also her third Odd Salon Talk. It is also her birthday. You know the words. Her name is Rebecca. Are you ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rebecca. Happy birthday to you. You guys are great. Now, I will warn you, for my birthday, the universe has given me a terrible illness. And so if I cough on the stage and stop, I expect you to be supportive because it is my birthday. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> the Olympic Games, spectacular, most spectacular of spectacles, celebration of the human body and spirit, triumph of international diplomacy staged in the most storied cities of the world theater. Places like Athens, Greece, Paris, France, St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> The first Olympics took place in 776 BC. They continued until 363 AD when Christianity was declared the new religion of Rome and traditional pagan symbols and practices were suppressed and a custom that had lasted over what, 1100 years. Over 1500 years later, those symbols had been dusted off and imbued with new meaning. The political revolutions of the 19th century had dispelled Europe's monarchies and the Christian dogmatism that legitimized their power. And entire nations had disappeared with the strokes of pens on peace treaties. This left a continent of freshly enfranchised citizens seeking a new way to orient themselves without the guiding stars of God and country. They found their place in this new world in the shadow of a past one. The rediscovery of classical learning and culture had catalyzed the Renaissance and served, as the, uh, and served as the foundational basis for the Enlightenment. As these revolutionary principles became the modus operandi, these shared conventions became the unifying characteristic of an emerging social group seeking a collective identity that transcended class and country. Today, we know those people as white people. And nowhere were the symbols of the white person more prominently and proudly displayed than the exposition hall of a world's fair. Starting in 1851, when Great Britain gobsmacked the entire world by building the Crystal Palace to host London's Great Exhibition. Western countries commemorated important dates in their history with grandiose festivals meant to elevate and educate their citizens. And in 1904, St. Louis, Missouri chose to celebrate the centennial of the Louisiana Purchase with the, uh, ooh, I forgot there's more pages. <laughs> uh, with the largest World's Fair in history. Now, the stated goal of the fair, to create a compilation of all existing knowledge in order to help visitors find their purpose in the new world which may sound hyperbolic, but these people were not fucking around. <laughs> the budget for the event was a cool $15 million, adjusted for inflation that's just shy of 400 million in an era when land and labor had only recently stopped being free. And if you want to know what $400 million can buy you if, you are pay if paying for labor is just a suggestion, the answer is everything. Entire castle made of light bulbs, and that's a bright idea. <laughs> exact replica of your friend's palace in case your guests get homesick. What a lovely host you are. <laughs> Chinese restaurant the size of someone else's town, no problem. 
medieval abbey that you can do battle in, why ask why when you could be asking where's the line start? In the, if the blog Stuff White People Like had been around in 1904, the Louisiana Purchase Exposition would have broken the internet. <laughs> The fairgrounds covered just under two square miles. Between April 30th and December 1st, over 19.5 million people passed through the turnstiles, the equivalent of 26% of the total population of the United States. Yeah, I said not fucking round. <laughs> So one might think that the organizers of a new athletic festival known as the Modern Olympics would be thrilled that the American representatives had accepted an invitation to be excluded in the exposition. To the contrary, their attitude is best summarized in the words of the Modern Olympics founder, whose French accent I'm going to have fun with. The success of the, of the St. Louis Olympic Games, the first to be held on the American continent, were a success in sporting terms and benefited from the crowds attending the World's Fair. Alas, their memory remains tainted by the anthropological days for all they were not part of the official program. But this was 1904 in the United States of America. So, you might have noticed that over the course of this lecture, an elephant has wandered into the room. It is here to tell us that the implicit utility of collective identity is knowing who we are so we may know who we are not. These opulent exhibitions were an exercise in nationalist Oop. in nationalist, ethnocentric, imperialist ideologies staged to supply citizens with cultural reference points advancing the politics of colonialism. In, in this new world, classical Greece and Rome became not just an influence on, but a metaphor for, present times, use, for the present times used as a rhetorical pretext for invasion, subjugation, and genocide. And nowhere were these ideas more prevalent or practically applicable than in the United States of America. Those of you who come to Odsland often already know what this story could use. A megalomaniacal white man here to surprise and disturb us with his own idiosyncratic brand of problematic enterprise. <laughs> and as luck would have it, I have too. <laughs> this is William McGee. He was a respected geologist and acting president of the American Anthropological Association who had been appointed director of the exposition's own Department of Anthropology. Acting in this capacity, McGee recruited thousands of indigenous peoples from 75 different societies to live together in a vast complex of model villages constructed by the inhabitants using raw materials imported from their native homelands. There, they spent their days demonstrating their native customs, producing traditional goods, and engaging in scenes from daily life for the education and entertainment of fairgoers. Along with these spectacles, the Department of Anthropology staged reenactments of battles against colonized people using real veterans and performed public experiments comparing the physical and mental characteristics of different races. Which brings us back to the Olympics. Meet James E. Sullivan. He, new white guy. He had helped found the Amateur Athletic Association in 1888 and was the editor of Spalding's Athletic Almanac. He was the obvious choice for the exposition's departments of physical culture, which made him the director of the Olympic Games. What brought Sullivan and McGee together was what they hoped to prove and how. Both men were amateur to contributors to the fledgling discipline of scientific anthropology, which utilized experimentation and measurement as the primary method of observation. These two men did not just consider themselves men of learning, but men of science. That one doesn't feel as good, does it? <laughs> So, when they arrived at the fair with an agenda to demonstrate the physical and mental superiority of white people, they didn't just believe that they were right, they believed that they could prove it. And the third Olympics Games were to be their grand experiment. But here is the thing. When we refer to science in, the, in 1904, the pseudo is silent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
the scientific method was still missing a few steps. The relative merits of inductive versus deductive reasoning were still being hashed out, and the biases, errors, and confounding variables that could invalidate results were often only considered in retrospect. Hey, look, here we are in retrospect. So let us run this experiment again. The official Olympic Games consisted of 95 competitions between 651 participants. According to formal guidelines, Olympic Games had to be open only to amateurs and include foreign participants, and the 1904 Games played host to athletes representing Germany, Greece, Hungary, Canada, Australia, the Transvaal, Cuba, and Zululand. That was it. Neither England nor France sent athletes, and France didn't send anyone at all. Now, they, which meant that 525 percent, or 525 of the participants were from the United States. And if that isn't enough to make you say sampling error, know that the Olympics were just one part of the physical culture department, and that during the fair, Sullivan began referring to neither, nearly all events as Olympic. Still infamous among these impromptu Olympic events were two days of games open only to indigenous people. 100 athletes competed in spears throwing, uh, in spears, in spear throwing, baseball, shot put, running, broad jumping, weightlifting, pole climbing, and tug of war with several more demonstrative contexts between indigenous groups and local, local athletic clubs, which is how you get an image that is labeled in the Museum of History, the Milwaukee Athletic Club versus the Boer Nation. The express purpose of these contests was to prove the inherent inferiority of indigenous peoples by demonstrating their substandard performance in feats of athletic prowess. Sullivan was assisted by McGee, who intended to use the results of the games as data to support the, and legitimize his own racial theories. At the fair, these events went under two names, Anthropology Days and the Special Olympics. Just the hits just keep on coming. <laughs> the event was a failure on multiple level and McGee's data was never published. For one, the indigenous athletes that Sullivan had recruited were neither athletes nor particularly thrilled to be there. Most of the competitors were harried performers from the anthropology village who had been added to the roster by means of bribery cajoling, morbid curiosity, and outright coercion. Due to the rather slapdash nature of the contest, many of these participants had not been taught the rules of the games, <laughs> leading them to be immediately disqualified. In some events, officials had their contestants quit halfway through, somehow unmoved by the promise that, that the winner of each competition would be ro ro rewarded with his very own American flag. Sullivan and McGee wrote the event off as a success. The poor performances of the indigenous competitors compared to members of the local, local athletic club was good enough evidence for them to consider the, the physical and mental superiority of the white race as a proven fact. And if you think that is bad, you are right. <laughs> and this story also gets worse. Be because nowhere was the madness of McGee and Sullivan's methods more demonstrable than in the results of the Olympic marathon. On August 30th, a crowd of 10,000 gathered in the stadium to watch the races start. The only impression they got of the entire marathon was the sound of a pistol and 32 men racing out of the stadium. Only 14 of them made it back. The winner was unable to accept his trophy and was instead transported to an emergency medical facility. So, what went wrong? For one, studies placed the ideal temperature of marathoning at between 35 and 49 degrees. On this day, <laughs> degrees Fahrenheit. On the day, on the, this day in 1904, the, the, the marathon, the, temp, the temperature of the marathon was 90 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade with a high of 105 in the sun and the route was mostly sun. <laughs> Speaking of the route, far from flat, smooth tracks of stadium races, the marathon routes included seven hills traversed by unfinished, rocky, dust-filled roads. This variable posed an issue for the contestant from Cuba who was running the race in street clothes that included heavy shoes and a pair of pants that just for the race he had turned into shorts. It also affected uh, the results of one of the runners from Zululand who was not wearing shoes at all. 
He did manage to finish the race, but his own time was also confounded by the extra mile he ended up, ended up running when he was chased off the road by feral dogs. <laughs> that was not the only obstacle. <laughs> These runners were racing on local roads that were still being occupied by trains, trolleys, wagons, bicycles, cars, and people walking their dogs. Not to mention the fleet of vehicles carrying trainers, doctors, and race officials who often chose to drive directly behind or in front of the runner. The fumes of the cars nearly asphyxiated several people, and the dust of the cars kicked up. Uh, the dust of the cars kicked up created a severe choking hazard. Near, near the 16-mile mark, only the contestant, one of the contestants, was discovered lying unconscious by the side of the road. He had ingested so much dust that it had ripped the lining of his stomach, and he would only have died had he. And he would have died had he not been rushed to the hospital to undergo emergency medical surgery. A dozen other runners were knocked out by cramps, vomiting, and exhaustion, and a series of intestinal problems brought on from drinking at a local well at the 12-mile mark, <laughs> which happened to be the only source of water available on the route. <laughs> and you will never guess whose idea that was. This lack of water stations was an intentional choice of Sullivan's. At the time, it was a common belief that athletes should neither eat or drink during exercises to avoid interfering with the diaphragm or becoming waterlogged. The effects of various intakes on the body during ex uh, the exercise was also an established topic of experimentation, and so Sullivan chose to stage an experiment on the comparative effects of severe dehydration. Terrible science, yeah. which, which is why when Thomas Hicks, the marathon runner from Boston, began to complain of thirst while in the lead, his trainers refused him and instead administered a rotating diet of egg whites, brandy, and strychnine. <laughs> As I said, just keeps on coming. <laughs> He took the last two miles of the, 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 the last two hills at a walk, and by the last mile was hallucinating so severely that he believed he still had 20 miles left to go. By the time he reached the finish line, his trainers had to physically carry him over it. Hicks' suffering was not quite over, for when he had tottered into the stadium, he found officials preparing to award the trophy to another contestant who had indeed gotten to the stadium before Hicks, but had neglected to inform anyone that he did so by riding most of the way there in a car. <laughs> he, he was disqualified. After that issue was resolved, Hicks was transported to the nearest hospital, where it was discovered that over the course of his 3.5-hour marathon, he managed to lose eight pounds. In the introduction to the Olympic edition of Spalding's Almanac, James Sullivan opens with the following declaration. The Olympic Games of 1904, held in the stadium of the Louisiana Purchase Exposition at St. Louis, were without question the greatest athletic games ever held in the world. <laughs> and it is in these words from my privileged position in retrospect that James Sullivan proved something valuable to me which is that it is easy to construct a narrative that validates your own theory about how the world works if you are willing to ignore the information that contradicts it and discount the human cost. And so I raise my glass to the truth, to the whole truth and to nothing but the truth. May it always set us free. Where do I go?